Thank you, Matteo, for sharing your stories. Uh, obviously inspiring to all of us. Um, I imagine to all the educators in Mineola, and I know to me. So thank you for sharing your story. Uh, and thank you all of you for the important work that you do. Oh, let me start the uh, slides here. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay. Uh, excuse me. All right. Uh, great. Well, I want to start by thanking all of you for the important work that you do to teach. Uh, it is an honor to be here with the opportunity to contribute to your important work. And for sp specifically in Mineola, your work to inspire each student to be a lifelong learning, pursue excellence, exhibit strength of character, and contribute positively to a global society. I love your mission, and it's, it's an honor to be here to have the opportunity to contribute to it. My hope is that today we'll explore some ideas and some strategies that will help you further pursue that mission, um, and also that might give you some ideas and strategies in your personal life as well. So I invite you to, as we are reflecting today and doing some exercises, uh, to think about your personal life as well and, and, and how this might apply to it. I'm also really excited to be in Mineola today in particular. Uh, for three reasons that I want to share with you before we get into the content on growth mindset. Uh, so first of all, uh, Mineola is where my wife Allison and her sister Lauren uh, grew up. And they went to Mineola schools from kinder uh, in Jackson Avenue through uh, graduating at Mineola High School right here. And uh, when I met Allison, we were in college. Her parents lived just a block away from Mineola Library, uh, close to middle school, who are here today, by the way, Rich and Fran DiCicio. Uh, <laughs> some of you might know them, and some of you might have, uh, I know some of you knew Allison and Lauren when, you were, when they were here. And um, so I was telling Dr. Nagler this in his office, and he said, oh, great. Well." Let's look at some old yearbook photos. I said, great. So he pulled the yearbooks. He has all the yearbooks in his office. And we were looking at pictures. And I had so much fun. So I went back home. And I kept looking at pictures. And I want to share a couple of them with you. So here's uh, Allison in middle school and in high school. And as I was going through the high school yearbook, I was at first saying, oh, there, there's a good number of pictures of Allison here. Um, it's great. It's such a nice community, small community in Mineola. Everybody kind of knows each other and does everything. And I was like, wait a second. I think I know another reason why there are so many pictures here. She was a yearbook editor. <laughs> Give a teenager an editing job, and this is what you get. Now, in fairness to her, she, she did participate in several activities and sports, uh, including soccer, which to this day uh, she does. She plays soccer every week. And she also earned uh, a few recognitions, which I was very proud of initially, until the recognitions lost all credibility with me when I saw that she was selected as the friendliest. <laughs> My wife, the friendliest, seriously? Now, I know that New, York, New Yorkers are not known to be the friendliest, but still, my wife. Now, maybe she changed since, maybe when she got married, who knows? <laughs> no, but in all seriousness, um, just as an update on your alum, uh, Allison was inspired in part by all her Mineola teachers to become an educator as well, like Matteo. And she became a second grade bilingual teacher in an immigrant community, uh, serving English language learners in particular. And she continued developing that, expert that expertise. And now she teaches education at San Jose State University. Um, so uh, thank you for inspiring her and other students to contribute to a global society. Now, uh, her sister Lauren uh, is working at an organization called Compassion International whose mission is to relieve children from poverty. They work with the most uh, underprivileged children. She's uh, right there on the bottom right. And those are actually Dr. Nagler's hands. We're in his office looking at, uh, <laughs> at yearbook pictures. And when Lauren was a junior, 
something special happened for her, which is that she got the opportunity to start playing lacrosse here at Mignola High School. And she got that opportunity uh, because of the person who started that program, uh, who was Katie Sheehan, who still teaches here at the high school. And Lauren remembers those days very fondly. Um, she said they had a f horrible first year, but then they had a much better second year, and that, um, you know, that, that means that Sheehan was a fantastic coach. Uh, now, Ms. Sheehan at the time had a family friend who was a, a younger woman who was getting a master's degree. And uh, she knew that this person, her name is Jennifer Peck, wanted to be a teacher. And so she, and she also had played lacrosse before. So uh, Ms. Sheehan recruited Ms. Peck to come be the assistant coach. So Jennifer Peck, now Jennifer Machen, uh, was Lauren's assistant coach. And, uh, and, and Jennifer Machen, um, so here's a picture of Jen and uh, the lacrosse girls at the time. Um, so, so Jennifer, a few years later after she had been teaching for about 10 years almost, uh, she read a book that, was, uh, that made a big, big impression on her called Mindset by Carol Dweck. And she became very passionate about this idea of growth mindset. And she, um, she wanted to teach that to her students. She thought that it could make a big difference in their lives as it had in her life. Uh, and we can see the result of that when we listen to Matteo, who was Jen Machen's student. Um, so Jen reached out to, to us, to Carol Dweck and to us at Mindset Works, saying, hey, do you have any resources for me to foster a growth mindset in my students? Uh, because I think this stuff is important. We said, well, we're just getting started. We have a couple of resources. Uh, here they are. Uh, we would love your feedback. And, and Jen started uh, just being really creative and building on those resources and doing amazing things for her students and contributing to what we were doing, which would help us you know, help teachers everywhere. So we started collaborating with Jen, and we've been collaborating with her and working with her for, for over 10 years, and that's the second reason that it's really special for me to be here, is to have the opportunity to work with Jen more closely and with Jen's colleagues. When, when, I, when I did a TEDx talk on the growth mindset that Matteo mentioned, uh, one of the things that people like the most about that talk is the way I ended it. And I said something like, if you hear yourself saying, I can't do it, add yet. And at the time, people hadn't associated that word yet with growth mindset. But I learned that word yet from Jen. Like, it was Jen's idea that yet was an important word to associate with growth mindset. And that's just one example of all the things that I have learned from Jen Machen over time. Uh, so thank you, Jen, for all you've done. And it's an honor to be able to work with you. So that's the second reason why it's really special for me to be here in Mineola. The third reason is that a gro this growth mindset effort happening here is really being driven by the leadership, uh, by Dr. Nagler, by Matt Gavin. And when that happens, when the leadership is driving an effort like this, a cultural effort on growth mindset, really special things can happen. And they're doing it by modeling being learners, by learning with others, uh, by creating low stakes learning zones and having the opportunity to collaborate with an effort like this is special, and I'm excited for the opportunity that we all have to go in that journey and learn together. Uh, so thank you, it's great to be here. Um, so the learning goals for this session are threefold. First, uh, we're going to deepen our understanding of growth mindset, that's my hope. Second, generate personal connections to growth mindset, insights, and strategies. And third, explore implications for our work to further strengthen learning and equity. What can we do about this? Let's identify some initial steps. Of course, this is going to be a never-ending learning journey. We can always continue to learn on anything that we do. Um, and, and finally, uh, make progress on getting on the same page. So meaning we're going to be doing a cohesive co co effort as a team here in Mineola. Let's start getting on the page about what we're talking about and how we're going about it. Um, so just out of curiosity, before Matteo spoke earlier today, who had heard of growth mindset before? So almost everybody, okay. 
so growth mindset was discovered by Professor Carol Dweck. She wrote this book called Mindset, which you can, if you haven't read, is, is one resource to learn more about it. Um, now, in the session today, we're going to do a couple of short exercises, and we're going to need your phones or mobile devices to do that. So I would, I'll invite you to take those out right now. And we're going to do the first, the first reflection using them. And what you're going to do is you have two options, either texting your answers or going to a URL in a browser. So you can do either. If you're texting, then I need you to text to the number 22333, the word works, and send that text. You only need to do that once. Or you can go to the URL at the bottom of this page, paulev.com slash works. And once you do that, I want you to either send another text or answer the, this question. <laughs> well, you can, uh, yeah. So you can either text to the number 22333, the word works, or go to the URL at the bottom of this page. And you'll have these instructions in the next page too. Once you do that, I want you to answer the question at the top of this page. In my own words, what does growth mindset mean? In my own words, what does growth mindset mean? So. Never giving up despite failures. View failure as a signal to change your strategy. Never giving up on my dreams. Your current situation does not have to be your final destination. There are no limits. I'll give you a few more seconds to finish your reflection. All right, so you can continue submitting your answers if you'd like. The reason that I asked this question, the main reason, is that when we ask that question, we often get lots of different answers. And we, we got lots of different answers today. Um, and that's normal. That's where we are in the state of development of growth mindset. But growth mindset is not any number of a lot of things. Growth mindset is something actually very specific. And I want to make sure that we're clear about what we're talking about today uh, before we dive into growth mindset. So when we ask the question, we often hear it's working hard or believing in oneself pursuing challenges, being open-minded, having high expectations, persevering. And none of those things are a growth mindset. A growth mindset is the understanding that we can develop our qualities and abilities. You can phrase that in different ways, but what I want you to do now is look at what you wrote and think about whether you incorporated the idea that people can change or that abilities can change or that we can get better. That is the critical part of what a growth mindset is. And if we're not clear on that, it's really hard to foster a growth mindset and a growth mindset culture. Because what happens if we're not clear on that is that we tend to want to foster the behaviors directly, those things at the top, like working hard and persevering. We might tell kids, you have to work hard. You, you have to stick, at, stick to it. And what the growth mindset research has shown is that just doing that and trying to change the behaviors is not very effective if we don't try to also change the belief that is underlying those behaviors, the understanding that we can improve and we can, we can change. And that's what a growth mindset is. And we need to do both. It's not a bad thing to try to change the behaviors, but we also have to figure out what is this person, what am I thinking or what is this person thinking about the nature of qualities and abilities and how can we change that so that they see them as mountains. Um, so to give you a little bit of context on, on that exercise, uh, this is a chart of the Google searches for the term social emotional learning for the last five years. And so um, we can see that in the last five years, people have 
increased the rate at which they search for social emotional learning by about three times, from about 25 to about 75. So it's grown a lot in the last five years. Now, I'm going to add to this chart how often people have searched for the term growth mindset over the last five years, leaving the blue line so, as a reference. And this is what that looks like. So over the last five years, people have become really interested in the term growth mindset. People have, there's been a lot of awareness and growth on, on growth mindset, and people think it's a good thing, and they're excited about it. But you know, growth mindset is a very nascent thing, and people are still, we're still not clear on even what it is. So we think it's a good thing, and we're excited about it. Without being clear about what it is, that's fine. That's the normal part of learning. Um, but, but now what we need to do is try to really distill what does that really mean and how can we really make it happen. Um, so Jen uh, started working with us. This, this, the beginning of this chart starts in 2012. Jen started working with us in 2009. Uh, so the, when she read the book, you know, very few people had read the book and she's been working at this for a long time. Um, so uh, growth mindset is the understanding that we can develop our qualities and abilities. Um, so, one of those abilities that I'm particularly intrigued with in terms of a fixed or growth mindset about is the ability to play chess. Because chess is something that requires a lot of cognition. It requires kind of being able to think well, being able to be smart, right? And even more than chess, I'm intrigued by the idea of blindfold chess, which is when people play a game of chess completely blindfolded without looking at the chessboard. So they'll say, bishop to d3, and the other person will say, pawn to e7. And he'll say, rook to d4. And they'll play the whole game of chess without even looking at the board. And I'm just thinking, wow, that's amazing. And some people can play blindfold chess with several games at the same time. So the first, the first player will make a move, the blindfold person will make a move, the second player will make a move, the blindfold person will take a move. And the grandmasters can play games of blindfold chess against 12 or even 20 masters who are really good chess players and beat most of them. So I ask myself, wow, like, are these people from this planet or from another planet? <laughs> How in the world can they do this? Are they different than us? Is there something that's in them that's different? Or could anybody learn to do this? Do I have a growth mindset or a fixed mindset about this? There was a person who in the 1960s went on to answer that question. His name was Laszlo Polgar, and he was from Hungary. And when he was studying in his undergraduate years, he studied the biographies of 400 people who were considered by society to be geniuses. And what he came to see, to notice, is that all these people had started doing what they became great at from a very young age and worked really hard for a long time to become really good at it. And so he became convinced that he could turn any healthy newborn into what society considered a genius. And then he wrote a book about it called Bring Up Genius. And after he wrote this book, he decided that he was going to do an experiment to prove it, to see if he could actually turn a healthy baby into a genius. And he realized that the first thing he needed to do in order to do that experiment was to find a wife. <laughs> so he put out an ad looking for a wife with this idea. And he eventually got into a, a letter exchange with a woman in another country, the Ukraine. And he explained over letters that he wanted to marry her and have babies and grow them up to be geniuses. And eventually, Clara agreed to do this. So she moved to Hungary, to Budapest, and the, the, the two of them had three daughters. And at the time, um, there was a, a strong fixed mindset about chess, but there was an even stronger fixed mindset about women in chess. There had never been a female grandmaster chess player. And so they said, well, great, let's, let's develop these three kids to be geniuses at chess. That's what they set out to do. And in fact, that is what happened. So Susan, who was the oldest, she became um, the first female grandmaster ever. There had never been a grandmaster female uh, player before. And the criteria to become a grandmaster is the same for males or female. Um, Sophia, who was the middle one, she became an international master, which is between uh, grandmaster 
and master. She, she was a level below Susan. And uh, the youngest one, Judith, became uh, the best of the three of them. She became uh, eighth in the world. She was number one female player in the world for 25 straight years until she retired. And she beat the number one uh, male uh, players uh, like Boris Paskey, Magnus Carlsen, and Gary Kasparov. Uh, so they proved that we can develop our intelligence, our cognitive abilities, to levels that we tend to think are impossible. Now, I'm not suggesting that you go home and replicate this experiment. <laughs> and we might have kind of ethical concerns with this experiment, but the results are powerful, right? And by the way, these three women could all play blindfold chess against several masters at the same time and beat most of them. So that is, a, that is an ability that they developed. Um, so since then, there's been a lot of research studies trying to ask this question of, you know, can expertise and intelligence be developed? And one set of research studies was done by Dr. Anders Ericsson at Florida State. And what he did is he looked at the best performers in fields where performance can be objectively measured. And he looked at their childhood to see if there was anything in their childhood that could have predicted the virtuoso's extraordinary abilities later on. And he found no early indicators. So for example, IQ, when the kids were young, their IQ was not a predictor of extraordinary performance. The only predictors that he found was in uh, certain sports, uh, body size and weight, uh, were the only two things that made a difference in whether you reach the highest levels of certain sports. Uh, what he found did matter was first the amount of practice, but also the quality of practice. It's not just time on task, but actually the quality of the practice, and we'll talk a bit about that a little bit more. Uh, the, there was no expert who had become an expert without a ton of time doing what he called deliberate practice. And the second most important factor was sleep. He found that the people who achieved the highest levels of expertise slept more than other people. So, yeah, they slept more than other people. And there are a couple of reasons for that. First of all, deliberate practice involves full concentration at a very high challenge level beyond what we can currently do. That's really tiring for the brain. The brain needs to rest and to sleep in order to recover. But also, when we sleep, we learn. We make new neural connections. We disconnect other neurons that, that shouldn't be connected. And we become smarter when we sleep. So these people actually sleep more than other people. And more recently, we've gained the ability to look into brains and to image brains. And what brain imaging has shown is that when we think, what is happening in our brain is different neurons are connecting together. And a thought is just a group of neurons connecting with each other. And we have realized that we can actually create new connections and change the way that our neurons are connected, and that makes us smarter. So for example, uh, there have been studies with London taxi drivers that have shown that before people become taxi drivers, their brains look like the brains of anybody else. But in order to become a taxi driver in London, you have to memorize 25,000 street names, and you have to figure out where they are in the city. And you have to pass a really challenging test that says, you know, if you go from this school to this uh, hospital, what's the most effective way to drive from one to the other? And they have to actually, from memory, say what's the most effective way in a city that's not a grid. All the, all the streets are all bended. You know, to, it's a very complicated city. Uh, so when they looked at the brains of these taxi drivers, their hippocampus is actually bigger than the hippocampus of other people, or the hippocampus of people before they have studied for this test. So the hippocampus, which is involved in memory and in spatial thinking, uh, becomes stronger and bigger when they study for this, this challenging test. Same thing in animals. When you look at the brains of animals who are in boring environments, uh, those brains are less dense and they weigh less than the brains of animals who are in stimulating environments with other animals and toys and odors and, and tastes. Uh, so we have seen that we can physically change brains and that makes us functionally smarter, um, which is what a growth mindset is. So there's a couple of examples of people who tend, tended to be in a growth mindset a lot of the time. One of them is Einstein whom I think is an interesting example because we tend to think of him with a fixed mindset. We tend to think that he did all these amazing things because his intelligence was fixed at a high level. He was different than other people somehow, and that's why he could think this way. 
but that's not how he thought about it himself. He had a lot of growth mindset quotes. Uh, one of them, as an example, is, it's not that I'm so smart, it's just that I stay with a problem longer. So he thought that his ability to solve problems was a result of his process, not something that was fixed in him. Another example more recent is uh, the investors Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, who are considered the best, most successful investors of the 20th century. And they're also very kind people they, and generous people. They have given over 85% of their net worth to philanthropy. And the question is, do they think of investing as something that's fixed in them? They're great investors because that's how they are. Or is that something that they have developed over time? Charlie Munger says, Warren Buffett has become a lot better as an investor since the day I met him, and so have I. If we had been frozen at any given stage with the knowledge we had, the record would have been much worse than it is. So the game is to keep learning. And Warren Buffett says, I just sit in my office and read all day. Read 500 pages like this every day. That's how knowledge builds up, like compound interest. So there are people who think of their craft as something that they just continue to get better and better and better at over time. And they understand that anybody in the world can always continue to get better. The best person in any one thing could continue to get better in that thing, right? Um, so uh, why does a growth mindset lead to higher performance? Like, for example, in the case of Einstein, or in the case of Buffett, and in the case of lots of other research. Uh, so first of all, when we look at people's brains, we see that they're working at different times. So when, when we put adults working to solve problems while we are doing a functional uh, MRI of their brain, what we see is that people in a fixed mindset who think that intelligence is fixed, they're very interested in just getting information about whether they got the problem right or wrong, whether they were correct or incorrect. That's when their brain is very attentive and active. Then when they're, when they're getting information about what mistake they made, and what they could do better next time, their brain is not active at all. It's not paying attention. Whereas people who, who think that intelligence can be developed, their brain notices whether they got something right or wrong, but it's most attentive when they're getting information about what mistake they made and what they could do better next time. So they're learning from their mistakes. And, and because of that, then in the future problems, they also do better. The people in a growth mindset, they learn more from their mistakes, and then they use that and to do better in future problems in that experiment. So that's, that gives us an idea of what's happening differently in, in the brains of people with a fixed mindset or growth mindset that, that accelerates growth and performance. So that's just an example. But to summarize lots of other research out there on growth mindset, um, this different belief of whether we think of abilities and qualities as malleable leads us to behave differently, like for example, how we see mistakes, and then that leads to different results. Uh, so first, people in a fixed mindset are most interested in looking smart in front of other people, looking talented. If there's only smart and non-smart people, they wanna be in the smart category. And the way, the way they go about doing that is they keep doing the things that they know how to do well and they're comfortable with, right? The, the things they can do quickly and without effort and without mistakes, they keep doing that because they keep getting feedback that they're, they're, they're smart as a result of that. Uh, versus people in a growth mindset can get bored if we're doing that. So if students can seem unmotivated if they're in a growth mindset, if we're not challenging them, if we're not giving them stuff that's going to help them grow, they're gonna say, this is a waste of my time, and they're gonna look unmotivated. So we have to challenge them. Um, second, people in a fixed mindset see effort as something that's negative, something that only people with low ability need effort, people with high ability don't need effort versus people in a growth mindset understand that anybody can get better through effort, so they want to be putting effort into things. That makes them feel good about themselves. Um, people in a fixed mindset avoid challenges versus seek challenges. Uh, when change happens, like in the school or the economy or anything else, that is seen by the brain as a threat if we're in a fixed mindset versus as a challenge if we're in a growth mindset. When we experience setbacks or make mistakes, people in a fixed mindset take that as evidence that they have low ability. So as a result of that, they disengage. They say, oh, this is as, as far as I can get with my abilities. I'm going to go do something else now. Versus people in a growth mindset are a lot more resilient. They look for different strategies. They stick to it. They ask for help. Um, and, and so they, because they understand that setbacks are part of the learning process. Um, people in a fixed mindset, when they receive criticism or feedback, they act defensively because they, they interpret that as a personal attack. 
versus people in a growth mindset listen. They say, what is this person saying? And is there something that I can learn from this? Is this something that could be useful to me? When other people succeed, people in a fixed mindset see that as a threat versus as an opportunity to learn from that person or, or inspiration about what we can achieve. Um, when there is wrongdoing, like for example, foul politics in the office or bullying at school, when we're in a fixed mindset, we tend to think that the other person is fixed in that way. So we tend to uh, attribute that to fixed traits in the other person versus to the situation that the person is in or to their current motivations, both of which can change. So the response to that wrongdoing is different. When we're in a fixed mindset, we tend to engage in warfare and reta retaliation versus in a growth mindset, we tend to engage in uh, conversation and education and negotiation and compromise, trying to reach mutual compromise. And finally, when life gets really hard, People in a fixed mindset experience higher rates of depression because they don't see a way around it versus people in a growth mindset are a lot more resilient. They understand that they can change and other people can change and the situation can change. And so they're a lot more resilient as a result of that. So it's just a little bit summary of lots of research that has shown effects of having a growth mindset or a fixed mindset. The other question that we get uh, frequently is whether we can have or be in a growth mindset about one thing and in a fixed mindset about something else, which the answer is yes. Uh, so for example, we might be in a growth mindset about learning a new language, thinking that we can learn you know, French or Chinese, uh, while at the same time, we can be in a fixed mindset about being creative. Like, I'm just not a creative person. And these mindsets can also change. Like, we might go to the fab lab here and learn some techniques that, that make us feel creative and learn, learn how to be more creative. And that might change our mindset about creativity. We might then develop more of a growth mindset about being creative, right? We might have a, a fixed mindset about speaking in public or about being socially engaging, something that we can't learn to do better. Uh, using technology, playing sports, connecting with a student and developing a relationship with students uh, or managing the complexity of life. We're managing email. Like, do we think that our ability to manage email is fixed, or can we become better at it? Right? So, now, when we talk about the benefits of growth mindset, often people react as saying, well, growth mindset is so great. Let's just have a growth mindset, and let's just ban fixed mindset from here. We won't have a fixed mindset. And unfortunately, mindsets don't work that way. We are humans, and fixed mindsets are part of being human. So a helpful early step in this growth mindset journey is to observe our own mindsets, and especially our fixed mindsets, and how they're affecting us. And that increased self-awareness and increased understanding of mindsets help us better develop a growth mindset over time. So we're going to do a little exercise right now. Uh, we're going to talk to our neighbor about when have I been in a fixed mindset, and what effect did it have on me? And, uh, one thing that I don't want you to do, and let's, let's, I don't want you to do the following. I don't want you to talk about when somebody else was in a fixed mindset. I want you to talk about when you were in a fixed mindset and how it affected you. And to give you an example, uh, when I was growing up, I had a strong fixed mindset about social interactions. I just saw my peers in elementary school or middle school or high school, and some of them were great at making new friends and being socially engaging and telling jokes. Um, and some of them were not, and they were very kind of nervous and awkward, and I thought of myself as being very low in my ability to talk to other people. Um, and so when, when somebody else came to talk to me, I would just get really nervous, my heart would start palpitating, my hands would start getting sweat, sweaty, and I would just blank out. I wouldn't think of anything to say. And as a result of that, I didn't want to do anything other than just be invisible. You know, please, nobody talk to me. Um, and it wasn't until I became an adult and I was talking to my friend Mike, who is really engaging and funny with people. And one day he was saying, you know, Ed, that thing I just did, it just didn't work at all. Next time I'm going to try this. And that was a huge aha moment for me. I realized, wow, Mike is so good with people and so funny because he's always trying different things and seeing what works and what doesn't work. And I've never done that once in my whole life. So I started observing Mike and what he did and then emulating the him and trying different things and seeing what worked and what didn't work. And I've gotten a lot better as a result of that. I still have a long way to go, as I always will in any part of my life. Uh, but I have gotten a lot better in interacting with other people, which has enriched my life uh, as a result of changing my mindset about social interactions. So now it's your turn. Let's spend a couple of minutes talking to a neighbor about, about when you have been in a fixed mindset and what effect it had on you. Let's 
30 seconds to wrap up. Great, let's bring it back. Thank you. Thank you for exploring this. Sorry to, to cut off the conversations. I encourage you to continue those conversations afterwards and throughout the year. Uh, they help us better understand mindsets as we explore them and also increase our own self-awareness, uh, especially if when we're in a fixed mindset, which then helps us cultivate our growth mindset in ourselves and in other people as well. Um, also, having those conversations are a bit deeper than some of the conversations that we have, and that helps us connect with other people, right? Develop our relationship with other people. So thank you for engaging. Um, I'd like for us to explore a little bit our growth mindset or fixed mindset, not about ourselves, but about our students. Uh, I want to share a research study with you on this. There was a Harvard researcher by the name of Robert Rosenthal um, who in the 1960s uh, went to some schools and he had the students take a IQ test. Um, and he explained to the teachers, to educators in the school, that this test was going to show which students were in the verge of intense intellectual growth. Which students were going to have a great year intellectually and grow intellectually um, uh, throughout the year. And so the students took this test, and they analyzed the results. And they went to the teachers, and they said, OK, you know, here are the students who are going to have an intellectual, uh, an amazing intellectual year this coming year. And the researchers left, and they didn't do anything else. And at the end of the year, they came back, and they had the students take another test uh, that also measured their IQ. 
And they found that over the year, the students they identified were two and a half more likely to increase their IQ by 20 plus points throughout the year. And also, they were four, over four times more likely to increase their IQ by over 30 points throughout the year. Now, this, one thing that this also shows is that IQ is malleable, right? We can become smarter. Um, but the researchers did not tell the teachers at the beginning of the year that they had lied. This, this test didn't exist. It was a regular IQ test. Uh, it wasn't meant to measure which students were at the verge of intellectual growth. Instead, the researchers had randomly chosen the students and given it to the teachers. So the only difference between the group of students who were identified and the group of students who were not identified was where the teachers thought that the students were going to grow a lot. That was the only difference. Um, and so then the researchers went back to the class and said, wow, you know, this is really powerful. What's happening here? Why is this happening? And they observed the teachers teaching. To, and, and they did the experiment again. They did several experiments to figure out what was happening. And what they found is that when the teachers thought that these students were going to grow a lot throughout the year, they behaved differently with those students than with other students. So first of all, they created a warmer relationship with those students through like a smile, you know, speaking with them more, tapping their back. right? Um, they taught more material to the students and more difficult material. They gave them more opportunities to contribute and more time to respond. And they shared more detailed and more personal feedback, not just good work, but actually here's what you could do to improve. Um, and it was these behaviors that the teachers were doing unconsciously. They didn't mean to be treating these students differently. But unconsciously, the teachers were treating these students differently. And as a result of that, the students were growing a lot more than the other students. So we can reflect. Do we have the belief that all students can grow intellectually, substantially? Because otherwise, if, if we don't, then that's affecting our behavior. So we can reflect on our mindsets, and that's one thing we can do. But the other thing that we can do is work on these behaviors as well. Make sure that we're doing this with all students, and especially with the students who don't look like us. Uh, because unconsciously, we tend to not do these things with those students who don't look like us and who come from different backgrounds. Um, so do I believe all students can flourish? And how might that, that, that be affecting my behaviors? Is something to reflect on. And sometimes we think, well, we don't do that. I don't do that. And, and, and that's our reaction, because these things are unconscious. We don't mean to do these things. But I encourage you, if you're thinking that way, to actually measure it. Like videotape yourself and watch the video later and actually like, see how many times you call on somebody, how much time you give them, uh, so that you can see it in yourself as well. It might be boys versus girls, or it might be different groups of people that you're treating differently. Um, so a growth mindset is powerful, and I think it's necessary to make the most out of life and to learn the most we can about anything. But also, I want to make sure that I say that it's not sufficient. A growth mindset is just the beginning of learning. It's not the end of learning. And so some examples of things that students also need include they need to be able to meet their basic physiological needs. Like they need to feel physically and emotionally safe, right? not bullied, for example. Um, they need to be able to explore things that they deem interesting or valuable or relevant. Not that we think is interesting and important, but that they feel that way. And it's our responsibility to make it interesting for them. Um, they need the sense that they belong in a learning community. When they look at other students and teachers, they see a bunch of learners, people who want to continue to grow themselves. Um, and they need great and ever-improving instruction. We can always improve as teachers. And if we improve as teachers, we'll make our students more and more successful over time. So it's our responsibility to, to continue to grow as adults, which helps foster a growth mindset in students, but also helps create all the conditions that are also necessary for them to thrive. So growth mindset is necessary, but not sufficient. But it is necessary for great learning. And so let's explore a little bit what are some strategies to build a growth mindset in ourselves and in others. Um, so um, I want to share with you three strategies on how to foster a growth mindset. First, we can learn and teach that abilities can be developed. That is the definition of a growth mindset, right? It's that abilities and qualities can be developed. So we can study the science behind that so that we learn about it. And we can have as students 
study the same thing and we can kind of learn about it together, right? As examples, we can study uh, the neuroplasticity, right? The science that shows that the brain is malleable, like the neuroscience uh, studies that I talked about. We can study how top experts became top experts. Sometimes we see people do amazing things, like we might see you know, Serena Williams playing tennis, uh, or another great performer, Cirque du Soleil, and we think, oh my god, these people are different than other people. But if we study how they became that way, uh, then that helps us build a growth mindset. And then we can embed what we're learning into everything we say and do. If we believe that abilities are malleable and that everybody can become better, are we acting that way every day, right? By giving people feedback they can learn from, by identifying what we want to get better at, by taking on challenges, talking about mistakes, etc. cetera. Uh, second, we can learn and teach effective ways to develop the abilities. Because we need to not only know that we can improve, but we also have to figure out how can people improve effectively? What are the strategies that work better and not so much so that we can actually become better at getting better? And finally, we can model lifelong learning and belong into a learning community. If we are saying to students that lifelong learning is important, are we actually behaving that way? Are we behaving like lifelong learners? Because if we are not, our actions are going to speak louder than our words. If they see that we're not being learners, then they're going to do as we do, not as we say. Now, in this session, I'm going to focus a little bit on this second strategy, right? Learn and teach effective ways to develop abilities. When we learn how to grow, then we become convinced that we can grow. And to do this, I'm going to share an uh, analogy with a group of people who are fantastic performers, and they're very inspirational to me, which is Cirque du Soleil. Uh, has anybody seen Cirque du Soleil perform before? Great. So, when I see them, I'm in awe. They do these amazing things, and they do them beautifully and artistically. And something that strikes me is that they seldom make mistakes. They do things almost flawlessly, which to me is, is a little bit of a conflict because what we're saying in a growth mindset world is that we want students to be making mistakes and learning from them. But yet, I'm admiring Cirque du Soleil and how they can do things without mistakes, and how can I reconcile those things, and isn't that confusing? And what we sometimes forget is that Cirque du Soleil could do those amazing things because they spend a lot of time doing something completely different, which is behind curtains in the gym or the studio. They spend time doing what's called deliberate practice, um, which is very different. If we watch them practicing, we watch them dropping the ball a lot. We watch them missing the timing because they're working not on what they already know how to do, but on what they're trying to learn, right? What is next? What's the thing that they, to make this show better? And the artists and the performances are always work in progress. They're always working to improve. Um, and so uh, they come to the, uh, to the uh, space, like to the, to the space where they work at noon every day, and they work on practicing these new skills for a few hours before the show starts, usually around 6 p.m. Um, so they're always doing this. Same thing in sports, right? So uh, in a championship match on the right, uh, people might focus on what they know really well. They're trying to minimize mistakes, right? Uh, so if you're having trouble with your left hand topspin, you're going to try to avoid that in the game because you know that you're going to, it's going to be a fault. Uh, but when you go to practice, you're going to tell your coach, all right, I'm having trouble with my left hand uh, topspin, so let's work on that, right? The focus is very different. And what we see in top performers is that they alternate between the learning zone and the performance zone all the time. Uh, Roger Federer, who just won Wimbledon and is considered one of the best tennis players of all time, was once being interviewed by a reporter, and he said, December was crucial. I don't want to say this in a cocky way, but I believe I worked the hardest from the top eight players in the offseason. Many guys went off to play exhibitions or were in the Davis Cup. That is, they were on their performance zone. I had time. I put my head down and worked. He was on the left, and that was really important to him. So top performers alternate between what's called the performance zone and the learning zone. And after each performance, they reflect and they say, what went well? What could go better next time? OK, what should I practice on, on the, in the learning zone? And then after they, they practice their skills on the learning zone, they go and they apply them in the performance zone. So to unpack this a little bit more, in the learning zone, our goal is to improve versus in the performance zone, our goal is to perform. 
the activities are, dis are different, and we're going to explore that a little bit more. They're designed for improvement versus performance. We focus on what we don't know versus what we have already mastered. Now, in the learning zone, if we're working on things we don't know how to do yet, then of course mistakes are going to be expected. We're going to, make, we're going to expect to make mistakes because we're trying to work, do things that we don't know how to do. Versus in the learning zone, uh, we're trying to avoid mistakes, to minimize mistakes. Uh, the common source of mistakes is the challenge level in the learning zone. When we make mistakes in the performance zone, there's still opportunities for improvement. We, can, we should always reflect on mistakes and what we can learn from them. Usually in the performance zone, the source of mistakes is that we got distracted or we're trying to multitask, we lost focus, uh, and that's usually the lesson from the performance zone mistakes. Uh, the desired response to mistakes is always learning and the optimal mindset in both zones is a growth mindset. Now, in the learning zone, if mistakes are to be expected, then the learning zone requires low stakes. The consequence of those mistakes must not be catastrophic or even very significant. Right? So a tightrope walker in Cirque du Soleil is not going to try new tricks unless they have a net underneath, because they know they're going to fall if they're trying something they don't know how to do. They better not die. right? And often in our workplaces, or in our schools, we feel like mistakes are high stakes. Students often feel like if they say something wrong, other people are going to think less of them, other students or the teacher, and that people want right answers all the time, not wrong answers. Um, and that pushes people to the performance zone. Same thing happens in our, in our workplaces, right? Where if bosses are, you know, are not, or principals or whatever, uh, are not tolerant of mistakes, uh, that means that we are going to always be in our performance zone that stagnates us, that, that, that stalls our growth. Um, so let's do a quick little poll here. Do I think most students see school as a learning zone or a performance zone? So a strong, if you think it's a strong learning zone, that's A. Mostly a learning zone is B. Neither one nor the other C. Mostly a performance zone is D. And a strong performance zone is E. So over about 70% of us feel that students see school mostly as a performance zone or a strong performance zone. I think that there's a lot of things we can do to improve education, but if we don't fix this, it's going to be really hard for students to thrive and to do, make the most out of school and to really maximize their learning. Um, so let's do another reflection. Um, what might make students see school as a performance zone? What might make students see school as a performance zone? <laughs> test, focus on testing, the weight of test, testing. Uh, do I see a pattern here? Grades, all the assessments, regions exams, tests, all the testing for losing points for each mistake. Now, I think there's way too much testing in schools uh, right now, for sure, and especially a lot, way too much. There's, there's too much summative tests uh, and not enough formative tests and assessments. Um, but I don't think that testing is a primary reason why, schools, why students see school as a performance zone. I wouldn't put it in the top five reasons. Um, because um, Roger Federer has championship matches that he needs to, to, um, to play. And Cirque du Soleil has performances where they need to minimize mistakes. And the fact that there is a state test 
doesn't mean that there's a lot of other time that's not the test that we could be spending in the learning zone. Uh, and that's the time that we should be, that students should be thinking of as a learning zone. So here's why I think that students think uh, school is mostly a performance zone. First of all, often all or most student work gets evaluated with a number or a letter. There's a number or a letter on a lot of work that students do. And that is telling the message that we ideally we want them to get 100 in everything, right? We want that letter or number to be as high as possible all the time. That means that's a performance zone, right? We're not expecting them to have you know, a, a letter or a number that's somewhere in the middle because, we are, we, because we're expecting them to work on things they haven't mastered yet and getting information they can learn from. Uh, but instead, we want them to be getting 100 all the time. That means you have to be in a performance zone all the time. That's a very strong message. Um, um, and and the, so rather than not putting a letter or, or a number on the work and just giving them substantive information that they can learn from about how they can improve, right? Um, and sometimes time is a challenge to give all that substantive feedback. Uh, recording your voice, your feedback by voice, is an effective strategy to give a lot more feedback and a lot more substantive feedback. It's just one strategy. It's an example. Um, Often teachers in the class are eager for the correct answers rather than examining mistakes and confusion. So we put a problem on the board and we say, who knows how to solve this? And we're hoping that somebody answers, raises their hand and has the right answer. And if they don't have the right answer, they will say, oh, that's not it. Who can help? Yes, that's the right answer. Now let's move on to the next thing. Right? Rather than, OK, that's the right answer, great. Now who got a different answer? And why did you get that answer? What mistake did you make? OK, let's figure out. How, what can we learn from this mistake? How can we avoid this mistake in the future? Focusing on the mistakes and the confusion rather than the correct answers. Um, often teachers were looking for narrow responses rather than encourage more exploratory thinking and more higher order critical thinking of things that don't have a right answer, things that we can all have different opinions about so we can all learn from each other, including us learning from the students. Um, when we adults spend most of our time trying to be flawless, right? Uh, we are all spending all of our time in our performance zone. Students are observing that and they want to all emulate it, right? So they spend all their time in the performance zone too. And finally, I think very important is there's lack of clarity in the difference between these two zones. We're not distinguishing when we want to be in the performance zone versus when we want to be in the learning zone. Uh, be, and so we might say, mistakes are great. You know, we want to be making mistakes. But then sometimes when students make mistakes, we get disappointed. Or when they don't make mistakes, we get happy. And they observe that and they say, oh, he or she didn't mean that when she was talking about mistakes. Because we're not differentiating how this situation is different from other situations. Uh, so we can make it clear to students uh, what is the difference between these two zones. When are we in the performance zone? When are we in the learning zone? And that lowers the stakes in the learning zone for them to challenge themselves and work on the things that they don't know. Um, so ideally, we want to be spending the vast majority of our time in schools in the learning zone, right? Everyday instruction, everyday student work should be in the learning zone, focused on what we don't know how to do yet. And yes, you know, state test, that's a performance zone. That's also useful. We can see how good we have become, you know, how, how well our, our strategies are working individually and as a system. And that's useful as well, right? Um, so I want to focus on this uh, second row here, that the activities in each of the zones are very different. Uh, they're designed for improvement versus designed for performance. Um, so one point is that um, we have the impression that to become great at something, all we have to do is to spend a lot of time doing that thing. If we just spend a lot of time doing this thing, then we'll become great at it. But that's actually not true. It's an incomplete way to think about it. So for example, in chess, for the serious chess players, the more time that people spend playing games of chess, the worse they become as chess players. The more time they spend playing games of chess, the worse they become as chess players. Because playing a game of chess is a performance activity. It's not a learning activity. So for chess, a learning activity, as an example, is to look at a chessboard situation between a game between grandmasters and, and think about what move would I make next and make that move and then see what move did the grandmaster make and then analyze why they make that move instead of this one. And you might spend 30 minutes trying to figure that out. And that's very different from playing a game of chess. Or for us, 
you know, how many of us have spent a ton of time typing in the computer or phone over the last two years? A lot. And how many of us feel we have substantially improved over the last two years in terms of our speed or accuracy in typing? Much fewer people, right? So we spent a lot of time typing, and we're not getting better. Because typing, as we do every day, is a performance zone activity, not a learning zone activity. For the people who want to become better typists, like the typists in training, they spend 10 to 20 minutes each day fully concentrated on trying to type 10 to 20% faster than their current reliable speed. And then they look at what mistakes they're making, and they use text rich in those patterns the next day, trying to type that really fast. And if they spend that 10 to 20 minutes each day doing that, then their growth accelerates. But if they're just typing, trying to minimize mistakes like we do every day, you don't get better. Um, now, so typing as usual, no improvement, but deliberate practice is a type of practice that leads to improvement. It does lead to growth. Um, so what is deliberate practice? Deliberate practice are activities specifically designed for improvement where we have clarity on what subskill we're trying to improve. We're not saying, I want to become better at chess or I want to become better at typing, but you actually narrow it down to something very specific. Uh, it's highly demanding mentally with a high level of challenge, full concentration, one of the reasons we need more sleep, right? It involves feedback, self-monitoring, repetition, and adjustment, so information about what we can improve so that we adjust things on the next trial, and ideally, guidance from a skilled coach or teacher. And if you want to learn more about deliberate practice and the research behind it, I highly recommend this book, Peak, by the lead researcher in the field, Anders Ericsson. Um, so, we can think about our activities on a daily basis. Like I, I enjoy tennis uh, when I go you know, play tennis on, I, I don't do it anymore, I used to. Uh, but I used to just go and play games of tennis on Saturdays, or right now I do run, right? And I just go running and I listen to you know, audiobooks or NPR, and that's not deliberate practice. I'm just performing, I'm just, playing a game of tennis or going out for a run. I'm not trying to figure out what skill I'm trying to improve on and, and doing deliberate practice. Uh, so I'm not getting better as a tennis player or as a runner, but I'm okay with that because when I run, I just want to listen to audiobooks and learn from the audiobooks. That's my goal, and to get good cardio. Uh, and it's okay to be in the performance zone. We just need to be clear about, is my goal to improve or is it something else? And is my behavior uh, you know, consistent with my goals, right? Um, so how about in the workplace, right? Do people engage in deliberate practice in the workplace? Uh, there was a really uh, interesting research study done with, by a team of Harvard researchers who looked at uh, a lot of research studies that had tried to answer that question for general physicians. So research studies who had said, as general physicians spend more time practicing medicine, do they get better? To what extent do they get better? And so this team took a lot of those research studies and they summarized their results. And this is what they came up with. Um, so the vertical axis, the y-axis, is the number of studies they found. And the bar chart on the left in black is the number of studies that they found that found that the more years of experience of a general physician, the worse that they became. The white bar on the right is the number of studies that they found that showed that the more years of experience of a general physician, the better they became. And the bars in the middle are somewhere in between. So we can see that on average, this is not true of all general physicians, but on average, general physicians get worse the more years they practice medicine. Why is that? Because they're spending all their time in the performance zone. They're really busy just you know, seeing patients all the time. And they're not, they're, they don't find the time to spend in the learning zone. And in general medicine, they also tend to forget information that's relevant to less frequent diagnosis, and they also don't keep up with changes in technology and techniques, so they become worse over time. Now, how about teachers, right? How about us? What does the data look like for teachers? For teachers, the data looks more like the data in other domains. And it looks like this, like the, the bar in the middle, the solid bar, is the average. And what it, looks, what it shows is that in the first few years of the profession, people grow a lot, and then they tend to kind of stagnate and grow a little bit over time after that. 
Um, so we can see that in the first three years, there's a lot of growth. And in the next seven years, there's relatively little growth. So the growth per year in the, in the first three years is very different than years three to 10. Um, now, the dotted lines are the 75th, 75th percentile of schools and the 25th percentile of schools. So at the 25th percentile, we can see that bottom dotted line. That is pretty much a flat line after year three or four. You know, teachers are not growing. And by the way, the y-axis is the change in student learning from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. That's what the y-axis is. Um, so in the 25th percentile, this, this schools, you know, the teachers are not growing much after year three or four. In the 75th percentile, they're actually growing a good amount. We can see that they continue to grow through time. And so the researchers went into the schools and said, well, what distinguishes these schools at the 75th percentile from the schools at the 25th percentile? And what they found is that in the schools at the 75th percentile, there were trusting, respectful, safe collaboration among, among teachers. There was time and resources for teachers to improve their instructional abilities. There was teacher evaluation that provided meaningful feedback, not just you know, good job or bad job. And there were school leaders who supported teachers. So in other words, there were mechanisms for teachers to spend in the learning zone, including low stakes and collaboration among teachers to learn from one another. Um, so a couple of sample learning zone activities for educators. And as we go through this, I would love for you to think about which ones of these am I doing well? I feel like I, I am engaging in well. And are there some of these that I could engage in more, right? And I could improve upon. Read books about instruction and teaching. Watch videos. Take courses. Attend high quality PDs. Identify what subskill I want to improve and how I'll go about improvement and share that with colleagues so that they can give me ideas and feedback. Seek feedback from leaders and peers. Invite them to my room to observe and feedback from students. Videotape my own lessons and review them or send them to a coach or colleague for feedback. Observe other colleagues or experts in videos and emulate them. Try different strategies from them. Experiment with new practices and assess their impact. Or reflect on what went well, what didn't go well, and what to try differently next time. So are there one or two of these things that you could improve upon and that you are interested in improving upon? If so, make a note of it. So let's do a little survey. To what extent do I spend time in the learning zone? A, if I spend significant time in the learning zone as an individual and with my colleagues. B, if I am pretty good when it comes to the learning zone, but I could improve a bit more. I spend some time in the learning zone, but could significantly improve C. And I spend almost no time in the learning zone D. Great. So most of us feel I'm pretty good when it comes to the learning zone, but I could improve a bit more. Great. I hope that we explore some ideas for you to do that, uh, regardless of where you are in this spectrum. So what makes it challenging for me to spend more time in the learning zone? Let's reflect on that. What makes it challenging for me to spend more time in the learning zone? Schedules, time, 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 time. I think I see a pattern here. No free time, 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 time. Flexibility in the schedule, demands. My performance is evaluated. Great, well, I want to share some thoughts with regards to the challenge of time, okay? There was a famous violinist who once went to um, his famous violinist teacher, and he was curious as to how much time he should spend doing deliberate practice, so he asked him, how many hours a day should I practice? And the teacher said, if you practice with your fingers, no amount is enough. If you practice with your head, Two hours is plenty. 
Now, violinists have the luxury of just playing violin. You know, two hours a day is a lot of time, but they also are violinists where they can spend two hours a day uh, doing this. But notice that the best violinists don't spend eight or 10 hours a day playing violin in deliberate practice. That's the research, by the way, in lots of other fields as well, like ballerina, music, classical music, uh, math, chess. Uh, what, what the researchers find is that experts don't spend eight or 10 hours a day doing deliberate practice. They spend between three and five hours a day uh, depending on the field. Uh, and again, the reason is that deliberate practice takes a lot of concentration and you need to take rest. You need to go do other things. You need to let your brain make connections while you do other things. Um, and so my point from this is that we can focus on the frequency of the learning zone and how often we're doing it and making it a habit, making sure we're doing it regularly, more than you know, the amount of time that we're spending in the learning zone. And that's, that's a great way to make sure you know, we're not multitasking, but we are making better use of the time and routines and habits. Uh, so we're engaging in the learning zone on a regular basis, using more and more effective strategies over time. Um, so also, so we can think about our extent to which we are learning, right? But also I want you to reflect that your students and colleagues and people in your lives are observing you and they're finally attuned to you, right? And through your behavior and what you're saying, they learn whether you think that abilities are malleable, you know, to what extent you are in a growth mindset, whether growing our abilities is important here in Mineola or here at home, and how we go about improvement. They're learning from observing you. So in, we need to not only be in the learning zone and, and, and make sure we're regularly in the learning zone, but we also have to make it visible. Like if we are portraying ourselves as just knowers, know it all in front of students, as people who have all the answers and don't have any questions, people who are perfect and can't improve anymore. Even if we're learning behind curtains like Cirque du Soleil, they're seeing us as people who are not learners and they're going to emulate us. So in order to influence them the most, we have to make our learning visible. We have to talk about what are we trying to improve? How are we going about it? What mistakes are we making? And what are we learning from those mistakes? Uh, so that they see us as lifelong learners, the lifelong learners that we want them to become. Um, so let's reflect, how could I spend more time in the learning zone as a regular habit and make it visible? What is one thing that you could improve upon? Prioritize daily activities. Collaborate with other teachers. Reaching out for guidance more. Schedule it, put it in the calendar. When am I going to do this? Research shows that we're much more successful to take on new behaviors when we figure out when we're gonna do it. And we, if we put it in the calendar, even better. Use think aloud strategies with students to make my thinking visible. So think, share my thinking with them. Visible thinking. Share more of my questions with students and insights with students and with other teachers. Learn with your students, alongside them. Great, thank you. Twitter, learn from Twitter and collaborate and visit other classrooms, see what other teachers are doing and experiment with those strategies. Thank you. So a couple of key takeaways. First of all, we have the idea that a growth mindset is a good thing and that we have a vague idea about what it is, but it's actually something pretty specific. Growth mindset is the understanding that we can develop our human qualities like kindness or empathy or our abilities, our, our ability to think, intelligence or ability to teach or ability to connect with students. Uh, and that's what a growth mindset is. And the belief, that specific belief, is understanding is, is necessary for the behaviors to take place. In order to work hard and to persevere, to take on challenges, we, we need to have this belief. So we have to be deliberate about how are we going to build this belief in ourselves, our colleagues, and our students. 
in order to build that belief, uh, we can learn and teach that abilities can be developed, like the neuroscience behind the brain being malleable or studying how people became experts. Uh, we can learn and teach effective ways to develop, develop abilities, and the learning zone versus performance zone is an example of that. But this is a lifelong journey to study how does learning happen and how can we become better learners and foster students as better learners. That's something we can always improve upon. And finally, we can foster great relationships with students, model lifelong learning, and support our, my own growth and the growth of others. And those are three ways to build growth mindsets. And there's great power in doing this together. And again, what, the reason I'm so excited to be here, the reason number three, is that you're all doing this together and we're going to be collaborating with you uh, throughout the year and learning from you and, and lear learning from what you're doing, just like we have learned from Jen Machen's work over the next 10 years. And I'm really excited to do that. And when we do things together, uh, is a lot more powerful, A, because we learn from one another, but also because students are getting the same message from all classrooms, right? And we're developing a common language and a common understanding that makes our work that much more powerful and consistent. Um, so a couple of resources along the way. We have a newsletter where educators share practices of what they're doing in their schools. Uh, you can subscribe to it at newsletter.mindsetworks.com. Uh, we have TEDx talks on growth mindsets and also on performance zone versus the learning zone as well as articles on these. Um, we have resources on our website, mindsetworks.com, which you will have access to. We, we have a partnership with Mignola, again, that I'm very excited about, and you'll have access to our resources on our website. Um, if you want to learn more about growth mindset, the book Mindset by Carol Dweck is the, the, the authoritative book on that. Uh, and the book Peak by Anders Ericsson is the authoritative book on deliberate practice. Uh, and you have as a resource your district and your colleagues as well as us. And we look forward to being in this journey with you. Um, so a couple of uh, two more questions for you. And this is as a, a request to support my learning zone. Uh, I'm going to ask you for feedback. And I'm going to ask you two questions. One is how well this session worked for you. And the second question I'll ask you is what could I do better next time? Uh, so the first question, how would you rate this session? Uh, let's answer that, and then I'll, I'll, I'll ask you the last question. Well, thank you. Um, and the second question, what suggestions for improvement do you have? What could I do better next time? I would love your thoughts on that. Leave the books up longer. Thank you. Um, Mindset by Carol Dweck and Peak by Anders Ericsson. There's another book called Peak, which is also really good by Chief Conley, but that's not the book. Speak by Anders Ericsson. Spend more time on graphs and make them more visible, visible. Thank you. More reflection time. Thank you. Smaller groups with brainstorming practical ideas. Thank you. Break it into two sessions. Give us a copy of the slides to follow along and take notes on the ideas we love. Great. Thank you for, for the ideas. Uh, keep them coming. I will review this later. I really appreciate that. And I'll leave you with three questions. First, what did I learn today? Is there anything I learned? Second, what will I do? Is there something, some actions that I will take as a result of our effort starting in a growth mindset journey? And third, who will I become? In a growth mindset, we see life as a continuing process of becoming, something that we never stop doing. And so who do I want to become? next and how will I get there? Um, we, we look forward to being in this journey together with you. Uh, have a great year and we look forward to collaborating with you. Thank you. <laughs>